We are ready to begin, Mr. Chair. Hello, everyone. My name is Parminder Sandu, and I'm the chair of the board of directors of the Toronto Atmospheric Fund. I'd like to start today by confirming quorum, so I'll ask the board secretary to confirm, please. Mr. Mr. Chair, I can confirm that there is a quorum of the board in attendance. Thank you. I'll now call meeting number six of the board of directors of the Toronto Atmospheric Fund to order. Welcome to this special meeting of the board. This meeting is being held using the city's WebEx technology with members and staff calling in or connecting by video conference. Well, under normal circumstances, we would not be able to hold a virtual meeting of the board with all members participating remotely. City Council has amended our meeting rules to allow it during the COVID-19 emergency. Once the emergency is over, we will return to holding our meetings with the majority of members attending in person and maximum two non-councillor members attending remotely. In accordance with this advice from the medical the chief medical officer of health, because we are meeting remotely, we ask for your patience with any delays and technical issues. Members of the public can observe the meeting via YouTube. Although we are in different locations and meeting remotely today, the Board of Directors of the Toronto Atmospheric Fund acknowledges the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, Anishinaabe, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples now is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Members, are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? If you could... Chair, it's Chair, it's by you. Sorry, could you just repeat that? Members, are there any declarations of interest under the Conflict of Interest Act? Uh, thank you. So out of an abundance of caution, I'm declaring an interest on item number 6.4, headed risk registry. Uh, the nature of my interest is uh, I'm a recent appointee to the GMF Council, and I have um, a request in with the Integrity Commissioner on how to sit on both uh, committees going forward. Thank you, Councillor McKelvey. <clears throat> I understand that uh, for item number 6.4, then uh, you will be put in that item. There we go. That's better. Members, as this is a special meeting of the Board of Directors of the Atmosphere, we are only considering the business on the agenda and no other business. I would also ask members to please email motions on any of the agenda items to the Board Secretary at Half board at toronto.ca. We have 13 items on the agenda today, and I suggest that we go through the items today in the order listed. After the board has considered items TA 6.1 and TA 6.2, and the time is after 9.45 or later, we will recess our board meeting to meet as the members of the Toronto Atmospheric Fund and hold our annual general meeting. Before I go to the first item, just a couple of Quick administrative uh, items. Uh, Carol from the city's uh, uh, clerk's office will maintain a speaker's list, so please be recognized by Carol. Motions have been pre assigned to members, and all voting will be done by a show of hands. So, what, I'll, what the procedure will be, I'll say sh uh, by show of hands, all members in favor. We need to sh uh, do a show of hands, and then I will say thank you. That will be the signal to cue to uh, lower your hand, and then I'll say, Right, show of hands, any members opposed? Same process. Uh, thank you. We'll, we'll uh, be the cue to put it down. And then I'll announce the results. So our first item, TA 6.1, ratification of the calling of a meeting of the board of uh, the members of the Toronto Atmospheric Fund, May 21, 2020. I'll uh, read out this uh, uh, short report and then we can. Uh, have our vote on it. So, something the meeting of the members of the Toronto Atmosphere Fund scheduled for April 28th could not be held as a result of COVID 19 restrictions on the in person meetings. At its meeting on April 30th, 2020, City Council authorized the Taft Board of Members to meet virtually during this emergency period. The 
purpose of this report is to confirm the decision of the chair to call a meeting of the members of the Toronto Mixture Fund for May 21, 2020. Does anyone have any questions of staff on this item? Does anyone wish to speak to this item? All right. I will move that we adopt the recommendations in this report. By show of hands, all members in favor? Thank you. By show of hands, any members opposed? Thank you. That motion is moved. Next agenda item is TA 6.1, draft audited consolidated financial statements for the year ended December 31, 2019. This is a report from the Director of Finance with recommendations. I'll ask our CEO, Julia, to provide an overview. Good. Thank you. Hi, everybody in this remote version. Um, what I would do is hand this over to Rob Wotan, who is our director of finance, who took the lead um, with the uh, our auditor as well, who are on the on the video conference as well, as per usual. Um, so he can um, introduce the item um, and take any questions as can the auditors as necessary. Um, and we do, um, I think we, uh, Rob has one slide, uh, which the clerk can share, uh, in terms of some of the metrics when that is, uh, when that's relevant. So Rob, just let them know, Rob, let them know when, when that's appropriate. So I'll hand it over to Rob. Uh, good morning, uh, board members, staff, and, uh, the general public. Um, I, the report for action has been tabled. Uh, the first item on the recommendations is for the um, stabilization fund uh, to approve the transfers of $3 million to Toronto and $1.8 million to the Ontario Stabilization Fund. Um, um, Do you want to put your, you can put your video on and um... You know, if, I'm sure everybody's read the read the financial statements, um, and we're not going to walk through it. It's really, you know, uh, rather than. But if you had any questions about the um, about any of the items, this is the opportunity. Members, have any questions? We'll stop. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, it's it's Councillor Carroll. Um, I, I'm missing something in the instructions. How are we? I didn't forget if we were using raise your hand or lower your hand buttons or texting the clerk. I missed exactly how we're supposed to indicate that we want to speak or if we want to ask a question. Carol, um, are we using the uh, raise hand feature in WebEx or how, how do you want the speakers to recognize? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, the best thing to do, members, would just be to unmute your mic and indicate you want to speak, and then I'll I'll keep a list and the chair, and I'll advise the chair who's next on the list if it's a long list. Yeah, oh, okay. I, I think we can use vi visual cues. Put up your hand, wave it, you know, and the the, the uh, clerk will keep a list. Oh, okay. I just that I only now realized that the chat was disabled and had a little panic attack. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Well, oh, Carol, that's, uh, Council Carol, this works too. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, so, any uh, questions or anyone want to speak to that particular item? No. I'll then uh, move to adopt that. Yeah. So um, one one thing, um, uh, Carol, we had a, a a slide which Rob had prepared. Um, re, uh, if you could screen share. So one of the things that um, obviously an audit looks at our um, our activity, um, 
and looks at uh, you know does the the validation and and trial balances and the auditor sort of you know do do um, deep dives on some things. But some of the key metrics that we of course um, manage to um, and you will see one of them is the net asset value. It is a snapshot. Um, at December 31st of any given year, but here is the snapshot for uh, 2019. So the net asset value is uh, at um, over 52 million with both the Toronto and Ontario funds. Um, and uh, so we've been tracking the the net asset value and the performance of our endowment on a month to month basis going into 2020. Um, given Mark, the, what the markets um, are doing. So, uh, so Rob and uh, Ryan from Proteus and others, uh, Tim, et cetera, have been tracking that. And we have some other items which relate to what our you know, 2020 status is. But, you know, this is, this is the snapshot from our audit. Um, and then secondly, um, the next slide, uh, a key metric that we manage to is payout and and the board um, set a payout policy basically that um, it is intended to uh, limit the amount that we draw uh, from the proceeds or the capital of our endowment um, and it, just in terms of uh, maintaining um, our asset over the long term. Um, and so the policy is five to six percent of the net asset value on a four-year rolling average, um, and uh, and so this is the calculation. Um, so we look at both total payout um, and program payout because the balance, of course, is is the administrative cost, which we may try to maintain as per best practices to under twenty percent. Um, of our uh, of our operating expenses, so um, we are we are within our um, payout uh, policy. Um, the the NAV uh, is is an evolving matter. Um, we'll have more on that, um, and the audit uh, demonstrates um, our overall management of the endowment. And I, I do want to actually just say thanks to. Um, to Rob, uh, we, he, he jumped in with both feet into the deep end of an audit that was underway. And um, as I've said, it's a very good way for him to learn all about our business in a few short months. Um, and thank you to the auditors, um, the team, um, the returning team has always been uh, really um, professional, uh, very insightful about our complicated business and, um, and pulled this together. And also to, uh, to the audit, thanks to the audit committee. This is the first year that we had an audit committee, um, and who um, guided this, had a look at the um, uh, at the draft, uh, provided some advice in terms of improvements. So thanks for the team effort. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Julia. Any further questions or comments on this item? All right, I'd uh, like to have a motion. Uh, well, I will move that, that we adopt the recommendations in the report. A show of hands, all members in favor. Thank you. By show of hands, any members opposed? Motion is passed. That brings us to uh, just after 9.45. So uh, we've got items number one and two completed. Uh, I'd like to have the Board of Directors of the Toronto Atmospheric Fund recess the board meeting in order to hold its annual general meeting. Move that motion. Read it out again, that the Board of Directors of the Toronto Atmosphere, Atmospheric Fund recess the board meeting in order to hold its AGM. All those, by show of hands, all those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion moved. Change my stack of papers.
Hello, everyone. Doing the same script again, but my name is Parminder Sandhu, and I'm the chair of the members of the Toronto Atmospheric Fund. Board Secretary, can I have confirmation that we have a quorum for our annual general meeting? Yes, Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. Since we are starting a new meeting, and although we are meeting remotely, the members of the Toronto Atmospheric Fund acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, Anishinaabe, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Members, are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? If you do, if you do so, have an interest, please unmute your mic. Seeing none. Next, we need a motion to confirm the minutes from the meeting held on April 30th, 2019. Councillor McKelvey. Thank you. I move that the minutes of the members of the Toronto Atmospheric yeah. Fund meeting held on October 30th, 2019 be confirmed. Great. By a show of hands, all members in favor? Thank you. By show of hands, any members opposed? Thank you. Motion carried. Our first item is AF 2.1. We have three agenda items today, and we will proceed in the order that they are listed. AF 2.1, draft audited consolidated financial statements for the year ended December 31, 2019, and the auditor's report as required by the Toronto Atmospheric Fund Act of 2005. The audit consolidated financial statements of the auditor's report were approved at our board meeting today. I believe member Jacqueline Lowen, chair of the audit committee, has a motion. Mr. Chair, as the uh, board secretary, I will read out the motion. Moved by Jacqueline Lowen, be it resolved that the confident consolidated financial statements of the Toronto Atmospheric Fund for the financial year ended December 31, 2019, together with the report of the fund's auditors, Welch LLP chartered accountants, licensed public accountants, be received. Thank you. Show of hands, all members, or sorry, uh, any, any comments or questions on that? Seeing none, I show of hands, all members in favor? Thank you. Any members opposed? Thank you, that motion is moved. Next item is AF 2.2, appointment of auditor to hold office until the next annual general meeting. I believe Kim Mar uh, Marshall will be moving that and if we can get the motion on the screen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, would you like me to read or does the secretary of the meeting prefer to read? Again. I'll go ahead. Be it resolved that Welch LLP chartered accountants, licensed public accounts be reappointed and ratified as auditors of the Toronto Atmospheric Fund until the next annual general meeting of the members and be confirmed at the remuneration fixed by the directors and that the directors be authorized to fix such remuneration. I'll move the motion. Thank you, Kim. Any questions or comments on that? All those, by show of hands, all those in favor? Thank you. By show of hands, any members opposed? Thank you. This motion is carried. 
next agenda item for the AGM, AF 2.3, confirmation of the acts of the directors and officers to the date of this meeting. I believe Councillor Dayton has a motion on this item. Motion and Councillor Dayton can read it. Yes, be it resolved that those acts and omissions of each director and officer of the corporation, which A, were within their respective scopes of authority, B, did not constitute a breach of their respective duties to act honestly and in good faith with a view to the best interest of the corporation and to exercise the care, diligence, and skill that a reasonable, prudent person would exercise in comparable circumstances, and C, since the date of the last resolution of this nature are referred to or appear in or may be inferred from any resolution, minutes of meetings, financial statements, registers, records, reports, and notices of or concerning the corporation, which are now or have been available to the directors, are ratified, sanctioned, and approved. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Any comments or questions on that motion? A show of hands. All those members in favor? Thank you. A show of hands. Any members opposed? Thank you. That motion is carried. That concludes our business for today. Thank you, everyone, members and staff. The members' AGM meeting is now adjourned. Back to the top meeting. Complete that agenda. Now that the AGM is complete, uh, for secretary, do I need to pause for any period of time or? Mr. Chair, uh, you can proceed. There's a quorum present and I believe you, the next item was item three. That's right. Thank you. All right, uh, next item is TA 6.3, Chief Executive Officer's Report. I'll ask uh, CEO Julia to provide an overview of her report. Great. So, two secs. Um, uh, sorry. I can't find my report. Hang on, two secs. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, this is my opportunity quarterly or so to give you an update on what is going on within the organization. Um, and uh, there's been a, a lot of uh, COVID emergency related uh, operational changes, which were all the team is taking in stride. Um, and uh, we, we have continued working remotely, so business is ongoing. Um, we, and we've done, um, we do have um, a business plan, as you know, that is approved by the board. We track against that. Um, on an ongoing basis, quarterly basis. And um, so I, I did outline some of the activities that are going on, just so you have um, a bit of an update. Um, but I wanted, uh, and Fatima uh, took the lead and has the, the role of, of our quarterly business planning check in. So she prepared a quick report for you to, you know, with, with much less words than my report. Um, to give you um, a snapshot of where we are in the context of our, our business plan. Um, and then if you have any questions uh, about any of the details in my report, I'm, I'm happy to, to uh, address that or have any of the relevant staff address that. So over to you, Fatima. Thanks very much, Julia. Um, Carol, could I please ask you to put up the next slide in our slide deck? And you can go to slide number five. Thank you very much. Great. Um, so as Julia said, um, we uh, uh, track against our business plan quarterly. Uh, so this is part of our regularly scheduled process for Q1 and the quarter review, but also uh, the timing coincided with our shift to virtual tasks. Um, so we also took a moment to work with all of our staff across the team to ask them after, I think it was about the third week that we were all working virtually and getting a sense that this was gonna be for the, for the medium to longer term. 
uh, to recalibrate their own personal quarterly objectives. And so the summary I'm going to present to you is both, um, you know, it's from the it's from the ground up. Now that we know what working from home is like, how things have changed, what goes faster, what goes slower. This also includes a little bit of an outlook on how we intend to perform over the course of the year. Um, so as the as the headline leads, the pandemic hasn't significantly derailed us from the plan. So that is encouraging, um, but there are some significant impacts that we're managing through. Um, at a top line level, our policy team has pivoted all their priority and focus to ensuring a resilient recovery. A window, unlike anything any one of us would have ever imagined, has been thrown wide open, and we are going through it. <laughs> so that is their number one, two, and three focus um, with the support of the with the support of the whole office. On the financial side, um, we've got additional focus on managing our cash flow and liquidity, making sure we can keep our operations running. Um, protecting anything from stopping. It's an, it's a, a topic that we revisit regularly at the strategic management team uh, and also appreciate the board's input on how we manage through there. We've adjusted governance, um, including moving, our, as, as everyone knows and is here witnessing live, moving our meetings online um, and additional committee meeting touch points to, to make sure that we're getting the advice and input of the board as we, as we position um, decisions. Um, our May grants intake was canceled, and that was part of to relieving some of the pressure on our cash flow. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but for the time being, the, the round that would have just taken place was uh, canceled. Uh, but we look to be sticking to our August, uh, sorry, our, our Q3 grants deadline. We had four new hires that we had proposed for the year. Uh, including one that's a replacement for uh, an employee that we lost this year, um, but we've paused the, we've paused those right now. Um, one of the principles the strategic management team is hoping to be able to protect and maintain is to keep all of our staff. Um, so we've paused the new hires and some of the functions and objectives that were for those new roles are going to be undertaken with the existing capacity. As you can imagine, the site work, uh, the retrofit work that we were doing on site in Toronto community housing buildings has had to be paused temporarily, but there are no risks to that work. We just can't be on site until emergency situations lift. And as Julia mentioned at the top, we've transitioned to um, what we're fondly dubbing hashtag virtual tasks. We've um, added a few additional touch points to keep our disparate team feeling really connected. Um, we're doubling down on documentation and uh, introducing some tools to make sure that we can all stay on task and productive and connected. Next slide, please. So I'll just go quickly team by team to give you a sense of where we're at. The programs team, which is led by Brian, uh, seven objectives. There are no flags there. Um, the exciting news there is that the retrofit delivery concept, what we were previously calling the retrofit concierge service, an idea that the team has been working on for a number of probably the better part of a year, um, has taken on new meaning and new scale and new attention uh, in light of its, give me, but sure fire fit as a win on the stimulus side. Um, so we've documented a really thorough plan and we're working actively on fundraising and stakeholder outreach there. Uh, on the policy side, also led by Brian, as I mentioned, we've significantly pivoted to focus on uh, advocating for green stimulus. We're working closely with allies and stakeholders on key files as well to make sure that things that were in place on backslide. Uh, for example, the clean fuel standard, um, you're getting a lot of oil and gas lobby against these kinds of measures and we're making sure that they stay in place. Impact investing led by Tim, 11 objectives, half of them are underway. Uh, a significant area of work, an important area of work in terms of scaling TAPS operations included process improvements and documentation improvements specifically to support our impact investing uh, team and portfolio. That has been affected by the hiring freeze, but we have rescoped the work and assigned it internally uh, so that we can still get this critical work done, this foundational work done, and that's underway right now. Uh, and another area of priority are new financial tools, which need resourcing. And this one has some attention on my part because this is something we carried over from last year and we want to see get done in 2020. Grants and capacity building led by Ian, three objectives. Um, we're tracking as, as expected, except for this uh, cancellation of the May grants round. Um, it does alleviate some immediate cash flow pressure, but it also gives us an opportunity to understand what grantees uh, need of us, what opportunities they're seeing, and then pivot our focus accordingly. So um, I believe Ryan is going to share a small update, but he's actively in touch with potential grantees and past grantees to see what the need is. Next slide, please. Uh, communications and outreach team, um, which is the team I lead, nine objectives there. 
things are rolling as planned. We've pivoted our content strategy and messaging, uh, as many have, uh, in response to the pandemic, in response to the resilient recovery opportunity. Our uh, planned events are shifting online where possible. And regional outreach uh, is focused on identifying uh, needs in the GTHJ uh, for climate programs that need funding. We know that there's funding programs out there. We know that there are great program ideas out there, but they're not necessarily being matched up. And so we're putting an extra focus there um, and also doing some work right now to improve um, GHG quantification methodology, quality of data through the development of a new community of practice, which is part of our business plan 2020. Quantification, uh, the GHG quantification and evaluation team led by Brian. Uh, most everything is underway. And uh, in the good column, some of the shift online has meant that that team has a little more bandwidth to focus on um, research into new areas. Um, an example is, uh, is is the MEPS category as well as um, natural gas leakage. They're, they're using this time to get some more foundational work done that they, uh, that they intended and are also a big part of the uh, community of practice. And then finance, operations, and governance. Lots of things. That team has had to pivot and respond and react really quickly to the shift that all of us are experiencing. They've been phenomenal. Uh, facilitated this, the full transition to virtual TAF. Everyone's got software and hardware and everything that they need and is connected. We paused a significant project that was around investing in a new um, uh, database, a CRM database, to help us manage our multiple stakeholders and relationships. Uh, we pause this because it's a, it's a significant um, cash investment, but also requires a lot of people in one place at one time. And so we just felt rather than trying to fumble through that in a, in this world, let's put it on pause and do it when the time is right. Finance is regularly supporting us with scenario planning. Um, and uh, Julia will speak to this later, but the federal endowment agreement process remains underway is delayed, but not for reasons re um, related to the emergency. So I just wanted to share with the board that we, while we have been impacted by the shift, we are managing through people are steady and engaged. We're seeing all of our staff members um, and the, the size and scale of the opportunity is something we're very intent on seizing right now. I think I have a lot actually, but I might've just said it. <laughs> Could you please switch to the next slide? We're good to go. Um, happy to take any questions um, if there are any. Okay, rock and roll. Thank you very much. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I did have a question. Um, I was sitting further away in the room, but I did have a question of the presentation. Um, you, you touched on it a little bit, Fatima. The the contact with the uh, uh, our our uh, grantee community about what they need to function um, is that ongoing in the sense of now that we're further out and we know we've just got to find a way to go on and do business do they have things they can apply for um, can we get action going um, with with COVID types of uh, um, constraints on them, such that uh, we could be doing work later in the year, because I think there's an appetite. People, uh, people are are as as many journalists are writing about. People are getting used to a cleaner, greener community, and there's an appetite for this work to keep going. So, um, what are we hearing from the people who are potential grantees? Ian or Ryan, do you want to take that question? Hi, everyone. Uh, happy to respond. This is Ryan O'Connor, the grants manager. Uh, so I have been actively reaching out to all of our current grantees to understand how this has impacted their work. Uh, of course, a lot of uh, convening and public engagement outreach type work has shifted to online um, and they've proven to be very adaptable and nimble in, in uh, shifting their strategies. Um, we've also identified a number of uh, cultivation opportunities that, that we see uh, coming out of, uh, you know, this crisis and, and emerging opportunities. Uh, so we're continuing to, uh, to engage with our stakeholders to understand uh, how we can best support uh, 
that type of work. One of the examples of that being uh, supporting public transit, obviously acknowledging that that's a low carbon activity that's at high risk right now. And so uh, I and other staff are continuing to engage experts and uh, stakeholders in, in that area to understand uh, how can our grants program support uh, that important work uh, in advance of the August 28th uh, grant intake deadline. Okay, so my my follow-up question through you, Mr. Chair, would be um, the reason I asked the the first question is is to to make sure that it can inform what council might say when it gets the 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 report uh, uh, next week on how the recovery team for for the mayor's recovery czar and his team will will proceed. One of the foc focus uh, areas. That, that we have is how does our own climate change plan uh, keep moving along in, in these new uh, difficult circumstances. Um, so if, if you were called upon to, uh, to give suggestions about um, what's out there in the community in terms of, of uh, people who can help us continue to keep working towards our targets, um, you might be able to to provide a bit of advice, having had conversations with all these uh, um, different agencies and and actors out there. Is that a possibility? So um, maybe I'll jump in, um, Ryan. Um, so I think there's two sides to this. Um, uh, one is. Uh, the grantee community, and you know, which is very broad, mm -hmm. it includes all nonprofits in our geography, um, and what they, you know, what the, what are the innovative projects that are sort of on point in terms of both low carbon and recovery, uh, you know, so the sort of criteria there, um, and uh, how do they fall within our strike zone, so to speak? So we've got some priority yeah. focus and. Interestingly, you know, we have identified transit. As well as obviously, uh, you know, it's in the transportation space, but you know, we've identified more electrification of transportation. So maybe there's a slice of the transit equation that we're more um, uh, right. focused on. Um, and then the the second, and so that's the projects. What are the activities? Whether it's um, on the ground, whether it's planning, whether it's advocacy, et cetera. And then um, to your point about the, the cities um, and other cities in the GTHA who are looking at, you know, what do we do uh, for recovery? Um, I've certainly been engaged um, with a variety of organizations who are really, I think, make, making the case for a green recovery. I think making it very strongly, it's coming through um, clearly uh, in mainstream media, um, we, there's certainly a lot of receptivity at the federal government for, for this. Um, and so it's about consolidating, you know, what exactly does that, what is in the, the, what does that actually mean? What are we ready to apply for and receive? And so our great concern is that there's going to be a strong interest in green stimulus but that the capacity right. on the ground is eroded um, for, for COVID emergency, you know, sort of uh, recession related reasons. And so there's no capacity to absorb that at the speed of stimulus, right? So it's not <laughs> right. And so um, we've reached out, I've reached out to um, the, uh, the lead at the task force, whatever it's called, TO, the task force on resilient recovery. Um, there's right. other conversations going on in other cities at the GTHA and how can TAF, not just through our grant making, but our own programming as Fatima was describing, be most useful and take advantage um, and, and steer this moment. Um, so I, I think it, it sort of, um, it, it gives, I don't think we're we're off on our at all on our agenda. Like this is in, in fact the yeah. opportunity for our agenda in a way that we haven't seen before. And so, um, making sure that not only ourselves but that the community that we support through grant making is ready and able is kind of our key preoccupation. Okay. Okay. Uh so, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, if you want to put me down to speak, I'll, I'll explain why I was asking those questions when we get to speakers. Thanks. Thank you. 
Any other questions of staff on that item? Um, and then can I just m mention one thing? It, uh, obviously it was in writing, um, but um, this is, uh, I think everybody's opportunity to thank Laurel for her participation on the board, which this will be her last meeting. Uh, just because of, you know, moving out of the GTHA, I'm sorry to say, but um, we really have appreciated um, the expertise on the board and at the grants committee. Um, and um, I, uh, you know, so, so thank you, uh, Laurel, for, for your interest. You're, um, you've been a fantastic contributor. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, Yes, my, my family's move was mostly COVID influenced. Um, we, we moved out <laughs> to support some at risk family members and we decided to stay. So we're in the Peterborough area now. And oh. um, yeah, so it's, it's certainly, I, I wish I would have been able to um, uh, do some more work and, and learn more and contribute more and such are the times we live in. And when all is said and done, it's a good news story for my family. So um, thank you all um, also for your contributions and I'm, I'm sure our paths will cross again. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Laurel. I'll call for any uh, comments before I open it up for uh, any speakers on this item. Seeing none, Councillor Carroll, I'll turn the floor to you. Yes, I, I just, I asked those questions and asked them to flesh that out a little bit uh, because that is the, the report that's gonna come to Council next is, uh, I'm sure uh, many of you read in the media, uh, the mayor's appointed this, uh, uh, Saad Rafi is our, our sort of recovery czar and there are these eight areas of focus that, that councillors are reporting back in on. Um, when it gets to council, I know what's going to happen. I, I'm I'm the chair of one of those focus areas. Uh, Councillor Layton, another Councillor McKelvey, yet another. And I know what's going to happen is we're we're going to be 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 asked uh, who did you talk to right off the bat, and then there will be motions about who should you talk to. And um, one of the things that I'll be asking in in that area is is did you tap into the expertise that exists within the staff at TAF? And what they know of the community, because um, there there is some excitement out there that um, we can go further now. Because well, while money is tight, um, whatever does need to be done in stimulus, we're going to want to tie green strings to it and and, and achieve things uh, 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 with any of the other government funds that come our way. Uh, while money is tight. Uh, we also know that there's a resident appetite because, well, it'll happen again this weekend. Uh, people who who are not uh, cycling commuters are nevertheless dusting off uh, bikes and going out and, and realizing what a different approach to streets would be, what complete streets actually means, things like that. And so um, some of the things that we can do, and certainly, um, in an era where we're going to again go to uh, really low cost financing uh, to try and hold the economy afloat, people will be looking at the changes they can make uh, along those lines in, in their own lives and take advantage of, of the economic times if they do have personal resources. And so we want to make sure we're doing all those things, but it's going to be, it's going to have to be, Julie has just pointed out, there will be some that if we provided incentives to do these things, they actually couldn't take us up on it. They couldn't make something happen. So I'm going to be asking, and if the answer is, yeah, we heard it, we had a call from them, but we haven't followed up yet. I'm going to be wanting to move a motion that they must follow up and they must really sit down and hear everything you know about the sector so that uh, the recovery team, if they make motions of how to use any stimulus funds that come our way, we're getting green bang for our buck. Um, but it, it, I think it's important to note for the, the board that we might be doing that in a council session so that it doesn't get interpreted as um, we're now trying to and have to, to work to our will. It's going to be a matter of moving emotion. We just tap the expertise. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Carroll. I'd like to recognize Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. And just, I'll be very brief, just to reiterate that point that Councillor uh, Darrell just made. Um, after some conversations with half staff, as well as city staff, I 
I had realized that the two weren't, uh, at least weren't communicating with one another as, as much as I think would be helpful for the city. So I made the request of city staff, the in, in energy and environment office in their preparation for um, some kind of recommendation to council to, to consult uh, TAF staff as a result of that. So if it hasn't happened yet uh, and we get to council, then I think, I think Councillor Carroll's quite right. We should give specific direction that city staff need to reach out to TAF because we are the expertise in this space. Uh, our staff are the expertise in this space and we need to, uh, we need to make sure we're getting the best advice possible. Thank you. Any other speakers on this item? I'd like to move, uh, seeing none. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. No recognize Craig. Uh, thanks, Perminder. Um, and sorry, are, is this in this in the context of the CEO's report? Uh, can I just, or are we still going through that with with Julia? Sorry. Yeah, we're still on that. Okay. Are we at the end of that? Sorry, that's the question. Oh, uh, yeah, I think we're 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 near the end. Uh, so I'll open up the floor for any comments. Okay. So so t uh, two questions uh, or two two questions comments. Um, one. Um, from uh, Julia and and um, and uh, anybody really, but um, what what are the key messages that you would have board members and things that you're saying to the extent that you're a be able to be out there saying things about what TAF is doing right now with respect to the general conversation about the green recovery? Because as you know, there, as as and as you alluded to, there's lots of convening, there's lots of high level talk. <laughs> And what can we help you uh, help get the message out about what TAF is doing or can do in this context of something that it's a bit of policy making, it's a bit of convening, it's not yet at the stage of rolling out programming. Um, so that's my that's um, that's a, uh, yeah a, a main and important question. I understand if it evolves a bit uh, because you're not in the in a place to do the things that you will be able to do. Um, so, uh, there are um, several things that I can share with you. We have been a part of convening the clean energy slash clean tech uh, community right across the country that has uh, put together. Um, it is um, the messaging that you'll see out there um, is pretty high level. But we, um, in, in a lot of briefings with the federal government at the political and staff level, we have very granular proposals. So this is really sort of moving into the sort of shovel ready and shovel worthy. And that was kind of the framing that came out of that or that group, which is kind of getting taken up, which is great. So um, we're distilling that down to the GTHA. So not everything is relevant. So geothermal in Alberta is not, you know, the the, the point that we're going to make here. Um, so having a more uh, GTHA and or urban focused agenda is something that we can we can share with you. Um, secondly, um, really getting to the granular level, our our big focus is retrofits. This is getting traction. Um, but the fact is that in order to flow the, the scope and scale of funding needed, um, and that is potentially possible at this moment, um, requires um, it requires this retrofit delivery center approach. It, you know, it's not money that is lacking, never really has been actually. It is, um, it is the support for building owners to plan and manage and procure and implement with excellence. And, uh, and so that is our concept has evolved from our own experience from actually undertaking that role with Toronto Community Housing um, and, and which demonstrates, you know, that, that like even a big organization with a lot of capacity needs that sort of third party independent expert support to actually move things into play. 
And so um, we are really actively in the process of talking to stakeholders to get support on the concept and it, it, it gets, you know, people get it right away um, to raise funding for implementation. Um, and then uh, very quickly after we sort of get it rolling to look at opportunities for scaling it up and out. So we're going to focus on multi-unit residential buildings because that's our métier, but um, what about the warehouses? What about the commercial sector? Or what about, you know, like there, there are so, uh, the, you know, the, the mush sector, et cetera. So this concept, this approach, is is scalable and adaptable to all those sectors and we feel it's a linchpin it's kind of a gateway for the the stimulus funding to flow so we'll share the the overview with all of you um and if you um have, you know this is something that you know is really concrete that we need to sort of get in play that we need support for um and having your uh, your networks on board would be very useful Thank you. So, uh, Julia, just to, if I summarize kind of the key messages are, are really about this GTHA urban focused uh, agenda is, is critical. And then uh, in terms of retrofits, other delivery barriers aside from just uh, the financial barriers, the delivery barriers are, are quite large. So if uh, board members would want to talk about that, those are a couple of key messages. Then. And how to, how to solve those delivery barriers. We have a, a very specific proposal. Wonderful. All right, last call for any other uh, uh, members that would like Fatima? to speak on this item. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, Fatima, did you have a comment? I just wanted to volunteer also that uh, Julie, our uh, lead on communications, has put together a key messages document to support our staff. And uh, Julia um, will share it with you, but I think it would be a good tool. And we can volunteer that for the board as well. That provides you just a, a two page overview of our pri priority messages. And um, I'll do, um, uh, maybe I'll share this to, and Mike, you want, might want to share this with the rest of the board. Mike um, put together a fantastic letter to the mayor's task force, was it? Um, which had a really, uh, it, it, it was a bit of, it was a shopping list, um, and, but all the right things on there. So just, you know, checking all the, the points in terms of um, how do we make sure that we are um, creating jobs, uh, addressing community you know, multi-solving basically so not you know it's not just about a, a low carbon agenda it's about solving multiple problems at once now that we have this opportunity wonderful thank you for that um well what i'd like to do now is if there's no other speakers uh, i'd like to see if uh, we can uh, or i'll move to receive the ceo's uh, report with that, a show of hands for any mem for all members that approve. Thank you. Any members opposed? Seeing none. Motion carried. We'll pause just for a minute here uh, uh, for the next agenda item, which is TA six point four, the risk register. Uh, I believe uh, Councillor McKelvey will be put in the lobby. We'll see you soon. Let's get confirmation that that's happened. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor McKelvey has been uh, removed from the from the stream and placed in the lobby, so you can proceed with the item. I, I trust that's a comfortable lobby. All right, uh, item number six point four, risk register. This is a report from the Director of Strategy and Grants. So I'll have uh, Alaska, the Julia, provide an overview, and then uh, whoever, or whatever staff needs to speak to it. Great. Um, I'll just turn this right over to Ian, who has taken the lead. Yes, thanks, Julia, and good morning, everyone. Um, so the context for this is that over the last few years, ever since TAP received its uh, second endowment from the province, the scope and complexity of our work has only increased. And we expect that this trend to continue, we're going to get larger and more complex um, when the forthcoming federal endowment comes in and we double in size once again. Um, Throughout this process over the last few years, we've worked hard to try to implement improvements to our program, our operations, our investing, and our governance. And one of the key elements on that list of operational improvements 
is um, that has been identified both by task board and task staff is having a tool and process for managing priority risks facing the organization. Um, and having a risk register also is one of the closing conditions for receipt of the federal endowment. So in response to this need, uh, we've drafted a risk register to support our process of monitoring, assessing, updating, and responding to ongoing risks facing TAF. Um, and this draft register has been included in the board package. I won't go through it in detail, but just to give you a sense of um, what it is, uh, Carol, if you don't mind putting up the summary slide that we prepared. Thank you. So these are the, there's kind of five overarching buckets of risk that we've identified. This is a, uh, through a process of sitting down with the senior management team and identifying kind of the major risk that we would face and, and the severity and the impact of them and how we would respond. Uh, and those are reputational risk, and that can be uh, really anything, action taken by staff, task staff, board or committees, or even the wider LC3 colleagues across the country, because really we're gonna be uh, connected with them in the, in the public and government eyes as well. Uh, that could damage task reputation. Um, and that could be, you know, in the forms of conflict of interest for uh, communications that, that have been put out that, that have a detrimental effect on, on how we're perceived. Uh, so that's something that we need to manage. Operationally, uh, there's things like having uh, continued uh, capacity, both at the staff and governance level, to deliver on our mandate. Um, making sure that we uh, protect ourselves against legal liability or litigation arriving, arising from, for example, human rights complaints. Uh, and, and having the right IT infrastructure in place to uh, mitigate the, the effects of any type of IT disruption. Programmatically, uh, this is an interesting one. I, I just want to highlight it. The risk aversion const that constrains task ability to fulfill the mandate. So we see as we have um, a larger mandate and we're accountable to more groups, uh, we want to make sure that we don't lose what we believe has contributed to task success, which is being quick and nimble and innovative. Um, so as important as it is to identify and manage the key risks that arise to us, uh, we also see a key risk is uh, being too risk averse. So, uh, so that's something, a tension that we have to continue to, to manage. Um, and then there's, uh, of course, lots of external factors that could affect TAF's ability to reduce carbon emissions, such as, for example, a recession. Uh, financially, we need to make sure that we uh, invest our endowment prudently to avoid any serious uh, downturns um, and to, and to uh, manage against any type of fraud um, and any other type of financial mismanagement. And then, of course, there's a very small likelihood that TAP could lose its endowment. It's small, but on the other hand, uh, it would have a huge impact. So making sure that we comply with all of our key governance um, and, uh, and meet the requirements of our funders is always top of mind. So this is just a, a snapshot of the key risks that staff has identified. Uh, the next steps are to work uh, with FCM to refine these risks. Um, and of course, if board members have specific feedback based on their own experience with risk management, we're of course open to that as well. Um, we're looking to finalize the risk register shortly, and then we'll start implementing it. Uh, and we're going to be doing that through um, a TAF wide operational calendar that we're developing, uh, which will identify the key monitoring dates, who's responsible, and what would be involved in. Uh, monitoring the risks, assessing them, and uh, proposing responses as needed. Uh, and then finally, we'll make sure to continue to communicate the results of those risk assessments, both with staff and with the board on, an, on a regular basis. So I'll stop there for any questions that board members may have. Thank you for that, Ian. Any uh, questions of staff on this item? I'm interested, it's Kim. Yeah, recognizing Kim. Yeah, I thought this was very good, and um, and and so I, I I applaud that you the the effort that was put into this. Um, I think it's uh, I really like the way it's laid out as well. The one in particular that I was interested in from an investment committee was the financial situation deteriorates. So I think it, just as you have action items to to go forward on that, I think some of this would be valuable to take back to the investment committee. So just keep that in mind. Thanks for that. We, we certainly will. 
Thank you for that, Kim, and rec uh, recognizing Antoine. Thank you. And, um, um, you know, I've been, uh, uh, I've been an advocate for risk management for a while, so this is really music to my ears. And, uh, and I think the, the, the format, the template is very well done. Um, so congratulations to staff. Uh, the, the one thing, and I'm, I'm thinking about the discussions that we had at the, the Grants and Programs Committee, uh, uh, upcoming item uh, about and and what um, <clears throat> uh, and and what Councillor Carroll uh, brought up uh, earlier in connection with what Councillor Carroll brought up earlier um, with regards to uh, sector capacity um, and the and and a risk being a loss of capacity in the sector uh, both with existing partners but also um, uh, the ability by partners to uh, execute uh, a key priority that we identify um, because the climate crisis is not going to get better. Um, we're not the sole funder. So we, in fact, rely on a very strong sector um, to partner with. Um, and if the partners are weakened or distracted, um, then uh, we, we lose um, our ability to, uh, to be as effective as, uh, as we can. Not for everything, because there are programs that, that TAF leads on its own, but th there are things that do require partnership. So perhaps consider adding it. Thank you. Yeah, we, we can see if we can, uh, if we can in incorporate that. And even for the, ta the project that TAF leads, of course, we never do anything alone. So partner capacity is important for that as well. Good point. Any other uh, questions of staff? I'd like to ask uh, one question uh, also. Um, this is uh, fantastic and uh, echoing uh, Antoine's comments of uh, music to our ears. I think uh, any board member of any organization, uh, as soon as you start uh, delving into risk management and, and, and uh, uh, risk mitigation is, is always a good thing uh, because we, we take our role uh, quite seriously in that respect. Um, Ian, just a quick uh, question. Uh, the, the registrar looks good. Uh, the likelihood and probability or uh, impact are all good. Would you, is there a plan to kind of come up with a control matrix around the risks as well? Or, or uh, is that a next step or has that been completed? Uh, what do you mean by control matrix, Fernando? So uh, typically in risk frameworks, you, you identify your risks and the likelihood and, and the uh, impact of those. But then against all those, I think maybe you use the word response, and I, and I just use the word. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if those risks uh, do come up, what are you as an organization or, or as, a, as individuals uh, to do after that? And so typically what we try to do is come up with all your identified risks, and then a control matrix uh, would look at it from a perspective of um, if that uh, – what controls on a proactive basis can you put to manage that risk? Uh, and then some of them could be passive controls and, and some of them are, are uh, more um, uh, action oriented after the fact. So you wanna reduce your risk by making sure that you've got those controls that uh, not eliminate, but dramatically uh, um, mitigate those risks. Yes. Um, so at a high level, we, we kind of categorize our potential responses into accept, avoid, uh, pursue, if it's a, actually a positive risk, uh, reduce or share the risk to, to mitigate it. And the vast majority of them will be in the re reducing category. Um, but w what we take, the actions that we take to reduce a particular risk will vary in any particular circumstance. So that's an area where I think further refinement of thought is needed, just specifically what actions are needed both to proactively um, avoid the risk or mitigate against it, and then if it happens, how to manage it effectively. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, what I'll do uh, in with that is um, there are many frameworks around risk management, uh, and I'll, I'll uh, send you a link, uh, one that has that defined control matrix. You identify your risk, and at the top, you list off all of your mitigants to that risk, and then you can put check marks and say, okay, if this happens, because there's only, you know, uh, maybe eight or ten different types of control mechanisms that you have for, for various risks. That might be helpful in this process. 
Yeah, that, that would be, I'd appreciate that. I think in many cases, uh, the risk mitigation measures are already in place. We just haven't labeled them as such. So for example, our PSYOP uh, sets, sets some very good controls about how we can be prudent investors. Uh, and that can in itself mitigate a lot of the financial risk that we've identified. It's just a matter of being explicit in pairing them. And then there may be some additional risk mitigation measures that we need to identify. Absolutely. Thank you for that. It's Kim again. Just one comment related to what you just said. Yeah, I, I, I think Ian, that's great when you talk about the mitigation. I saw in the category that talks about monitoring activity and that there would be reporting back to the board. So, is it fair to assume that some of that reporting on the mitigation and control framework would come back at those times? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, in the overview that we provide in the package. We have the person responsible for monitor, managing the risk and then the monitoring dates and they kind of range from monthly to quarterly to annually. And so we'll, we'll be sure to, um, to come back to the board and provide updates on the outcomes of those assessments um, and, and show how we've done it and, and solicit further feedback on that. Perfect, thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Ian. Um, so with that, uh, uh, last call for any other speakers on this item? Andrew, I feel you've probably walked outside of the GTHA now, so you can no longer participate. <laughs> All right, uh, well, with that, then I'd like to move that we adopt the recommendations uh, in this report. Because we do have uh, one um, member of the board that's uh, declared a conflict, this does have to be a recorded vote. So, Carol, I'll turn it over to you to organize a recorded vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a recorded vote on the motion to adopt the recommendation, which reads, the Board of Directors of the Toronto Atmospheric Fund receive this report for information. Members, when I call your name, please unmute your mic, pause for a moment, and indicate your vote by either saying in favour or opposed. Councillor Mike Layton. In favour. Councillor Shelley Carroll. In favour. Laurel Atkinson. In favor. Karim Bardizi. He's muted. Karim, if you could unmute your mic. There we go. Sorry. Sorry about that. In favor. Thank you. Antoine Belayef. In favor. Andrew Duner. In favor. Jacqueline Lowen. In favor. Kimberly Marshall. In favor. And Deepak Ramachandran. In favor. And Mr. Chair, your vote. In favor. Mr. Chair, the motion carries with 10 in favor and one absent. Pause for a minute, just uh, so I uh, want you to let Pastor uh, McKell be back in. <laughs> All right, perfect. Our next uh, agenda item is TA 6.5, unaudited financial reports for the fourth quarter of 2019 and the first quarter of 2020. This is a report for information from the Director of Finance. I'll ask uh, our CEO, Julia, to provide an overview. Julia? So um, this is based on just timing of meetings. We, uh, uh, by the, on the February 14th meeting, we weren't able to give you the Q4 report. So this is our, our uh, unaudited Q4 report, although you now have an audited one. Um, so all of that is much more, um, is com it comes together at the same time. So the Q1 report um, is there. Um, Obviously, this is a quarter in which we were doing a lot of monitoring um, of the uh, state of the endowment. Um, I think uh, Rob had some updated st uh, stats on the uh, endowment, um, if that's of interest, but it is estimates because we um, 
uh, generation, which is our biggest holding, uh, only reports quarterly. So uh, March 31st it is. We don't have any anything other than sort of a, a guess or an estimate uh, for April 30th, which would be more relevant. Um, but um, markets have been moving up. Um, it's still obviously lower than the Q4 closing, but um, but not in at we when we looked at it mid March was a little bit of a you know gasp. Um, uh, other than that, um, everything is uh, we're we're trying to keep um, our our uh, spending on track. Our our income from direct investments is on track. Um, we've had to pause some of the the retrofits, but um, but it really it's it's pretty much on, on track. So we have some uh, additional in and out coming up on those, which are some of the big chunks, um, and obviously the grants going out. So um, nothing super unusual to report. Uh, Rob, anything you wanted to add? Bob, you may be muted. Yeah. I, no, I have nothing to add. All right. Uh, any uh, questions of staff by any of the members? Seeing none, would anyone like to speak on this matter? I'd like to then uh, move uh, that we receive for information uh, the report uh, for this uh, item. With that, can I have, uh, by a show of hands, all in favor? Thank you. Any members opposed? Thank you. Carrie. Our next agenda item is item number TA 6.6, .6, minutes of the investment committee meeting held January 30th, 2020. This provides uh, the minutes uh, for our information. Maybe I'll uh, first open the floor to uh, Kim. Kim, would you like to introduce us at all? Uh, this is, um, a, thank you, I've got it in front of me now. Um, no, I think it's fairly straightforward. If there are any questions or comments, we'd be happy to entertain them. Thank you, Kim. With that, uh, uh, any questions of staff on the, these minutes? Would any member like to speak to this matter? Seeing none. I'd like to move that we receive this report for information purposes. By a show of hands, can I see all members in favor? Any member, thank you. Any members opposed? Seeing none, carry to receive as information. Next agenda item is TA 6.7, direct uh, investment request number two for 2020. This item does have a confidential attachment. If there are any members have any uh, questions of staff or would like to speak uh, to this in a non-confidential way, we can do that in a public setting. If there are confidential questions, then we'll need to hold this item down before we go into session. Mr. Mr. Chair, my only comment on it was a public one. Okay, for you then, Councillor Kerr. Uh, well, just that uh, when when we get into the to the items, um, there's a piece of this that is simply an explanation of how this type of investment works, and I just wanted to thank staff because uh, uh, my feedback in investment committee was uh, I know we've done this once before, but it's a it's a type of investment that's known well in in the private uh, uh, sector and in the procurement world, but may not be to all of the directors, may not be to uh, to the council directors. Uh, and so I, I asked if we made sure to put a bit of an explanation in there for the for the board. And I hope people had a chance to read it because 
it's a really detailed walkthrough of this type of thing. And so uh, uh, if it becomes if it becomes a, a, a vehicle that we want to use in the future to, to give the sector the ability to keep moving, then it becomes really important that we understand it. So I just wanted to thank staff for making a, a, a really good you know, charted and texted uh, uh, walkthrough of, of uh, PO financing. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Carroll. I know uh, yeah. Director Andrew had a, a comment to make, but before that, uh, Julia, I forgot to uh, turn it over to you. Do you want to provide an overview or, or um, Kim? Kim, for that matter. Um, well, um, if anybody would like us to walk through it, but I think, um, uh, you know, unless we're going in, in camera for this, where we might want to get into more sort of detailed explanations, then if there's more public questions, um, then we can take them. Otherwise, let's, okay. there's details, yeah. let's get into camera. That's right. Yeah. So, we'll, uh, uh, Andrew, uh, uh, is this a, a public type of question or, or does this need to be uh, moved to in camera before we take that? I'll turn over the floor to Andrew. I didn't have a question. Oh, okay, sorry. I thought I saw your hand being raised. Maybe you just tried. <laughs> so I was adjusting volume on the back of my iPad. I apologize. Oh, no, it's okay. I just saw this hand uh, kind of waved. All right. Uh, does anyone have any uh, confidential type questions? And we can hold this item down, or we can take a vote on it now. Okay. Well, seeing none. Uh, Carol, is that okay? Then we can just uh, move this motion. Yes, you can proceed if you like, Mr. Chair. So, Parminder, Parminder, I'll, I'll make this recommendation. It's in the material. Do you want me to read it out or? Yes, please. Okay. The Chair of Task Investment Committee recommends that the TAF Board of Directors, there are three items, approve investment of up to 1.5 million, subject to the terms and conditions outlined by the Investment Committee and as set out in Confidential Attachment 1. Direct the Vice President Impact Investing to implement the investment to the satisfaction of TAF's solicitor. And three, direct that the confidential information contained in Confidential Attachment 1 remain confidential in its entirety as it contains commercial and financial information supplied in confidence to the atmospheric fund, which if disclosed could reasonably be expected to prejudice significantly the competitive position or interfere significantly with the contractual or other negotiations at a person, group of persons, or organizations. Thank you for that, Kim. A show of hands, can I see all members that are in favor? Thank you. Any members opposed? Carried. Congratulations. Next item is TA 6.8, cash flow analysis and options for liquidity. I believe this item has a confidential attachment as well. Uh, so I'd like to turn it over to um, President Tact Investing or Julia to provide an overview that can be public facing. Good. So uh, the aim of this, um, as I was uh, uh, referencing in my report, is that we have taken a very specific look at our cash needs over the, the course of 2020 um, uh, in the context of uh, where the endowment stands. Um, and usually our approach for cash, uh, we have um, inflows coming from direct investments that you know, pay us directly, but then, um, uh, and then we have some external uh, revenue from uh, third parties, which are for specific projects, but the balance we um, we get is from proceeds from the endowment, basically realized gains. Um, and uh, the direction from the investment committee really was to um, minimize or avoid redemptions from the marketable securities um, in a downside. Um, and uh, which basically crystallizes losses. So, um, so uh, we have been looking um, on both the uh, management of expenses side 
Um, so Fatima referenced pausing some hires, uh, sort of um, looking at deferring uh, some grant spending, uh, et cetera. Uh, so we've looked at, at that and there might be a little more tweaking that we can do on that as we, we go along. Um, but uh, nevertheless, we do have operating expenses. And so Rob has been focused on looking at what that gap is and where the cliff is really uh, from a cash perspective. Um, and then uh, on the opposite side of the ledger, we've been looking at what are our cash options uh, short of redeeming. Well, not short of, I mean, obviously redeeming um, and in particular, um, generally, we would redeem um, in, from our fixed income. Right now, the fixed income, uh, certainly in the, the Toronto Fund, is at its minimum, so we would not do that. Uh, we do have some uh, um, fixed income above the minimum uh, in the Ontario Fund, so that's a possibility. But um, but there is uh, generally, um, and there has been on the on the um, agenda. Um, the intention to redeem uh, and mostly rebalance rather than redeem, but um, but to move uh, funds out of the generation holdings, uh, which are overweight in general um, amongst our managers. Um, and we may, uh, and we needed to do that because we were um, above our uh, allocation maximum anyways. And in fact, when we look at it, uh, we're still over our max. So notwithstanding the market downturn, we're still, um, you know, not in a terrible position, but in a position where we're over our maximum allocation on equities. So redemption um, is certainly uh, one of the options. Another option as described in the confidential attachment and, um, and in the um, and which is part of the recommendation is, is that we have um, really saleable assets um, in direct investments. So we have made uh, uh, investments in retrofits and um, and in efficient, uh, efficient buildings, which are highly saleable, marketable to um, investors who are looking for impact in their portfolios. We already have done, um, uh, we have sold parts portions of some of our direct investments already. So we have ex some experience with this. And so we wanted to bring this forward um, as an option to, to the board um, because it, you know, requires that there's, there's a certain dynamic, you know, we, we've already, um, you know, in order to, to move that along, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not like redeeming um, a marketable security. Um, Obviously, uh, other other options that we're looking at um, have to do with when we get the um, federal endowment. That that uh, you know, we've we've budgeted for having that in um, receiving that in uh, the third quarter, and it for, for it to be generating returns in the fourth quarter, um, we need to adjust our assumptions about how much that will generate based on market conditions um, because the the projected. Uh, performance is very unlikely to materialize. Um, so that also gives a bit of a dynamic as to when we actually need cash. Um, and so we're separating the need for cash for um, just basic OPEX and the need for cash for uh, direct investment advances, which is much bigger chunks. Um, so uh, this is really to to tell you that we are looking at a variety of options. It's a bunch of sort of moving pieces, and and they're not you know they're not mutually exclusive. Sometimes they'll they'll they may need to be done in tandem, um, but that uh, we are looking to have the option of um, of using our current direct investment portfolio to generate some of that uh, cash flow, ideally with, um, with an option to, uh, um, as described, to, um, to get them back into our portfolio if, that, if that's desired. So that, and Tim, do you have anything that you needed to add in a public context or, you know, if people wanted to go into this in, in more detail about the sort of pros and cons and, and numbers, then we'd want to go in camera for that. Sorry, I haven't got anything to add. <clears throat> in a public context, I think that the rest is all 
you know, detailed and should be covered in a, in a, in a, in a camera session. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Tim. Uh, so any other uh, uh, questions that members may have uh, in a public setting? Is there any, would anyone like to speak to this item in a public format? Recognizing Jacqueline? Yeah, I think uh, what I was very um, pleased to see was the um, approach of what do we need um, in the short term, and that short term period would be 12 to 24 months, and then the long term, as well as categorizing by operation versus investment um, into uh, investments, uh, as well as the companies that we're investing into. So I thought there was a very thorough um, approach taken, and I was um, very confident in what um, has come out of that. Just informally, uh, would anyone like to uh, hold down this meeting for confidential questions or speak to it in a confidential way? Show of hands. Krim, are you, uh, Krim and then Deepak, are you guys, can you unmute? Uh, do you want to uh, hold it down for uh, yeah. our session? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm actually, I, my point is not critical that it's conf confidential. It's just simply the general feeling that our private investments are, you know, naturally illiquid. And so I'd favor the, I'd favor grabbing liquidity from the public unless we set up a consistent systematic way to make liquidity. But that's a very minor point. Is this something that others want to talk about? In which case I'm happy to go, you know, in a, into a confidential session. I believe Director Kramer is saying that he'd like, he's had, got some uh, in-camera uh, questions, comments. So, um, Carol, what's the process? Do I need to have a motion to uh, hold this down for in-camera? No, Mr. Chair, you can just announce that the item is held down. And when we get to uh, the appropriate time, we can have a motion for you to go into closed session on this item. Thank you. Okay, with that, we will hold this item down for our uh, in-camera session. I'll move to our next agenda item then. TA 6.9, Direct Investment Risk Analysis Approach and Stress Test. This is a report from the Vice President Impact Investing with a recommendation. I'll ask uh, Julia to provide an overview. Um, and I'll hand that to Tim. Thank you. <laughs> you're a man of many words. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes I have to chase my cursor to get it get it out of the mute button. Um, so thanks very much for uh, uh, for this opportunity to speak on this. Um, so one of the things that we undertook as a team uh, uh, in the Impact Investing Group was to have a look at each of our investments. Um, and to assess them relative to the change that we're all facing uh, in this world. Uh, and, um, and that included all our uh, energy retrofit investments, our private equity investments, any future investments that we are going to make, and any pure term loans that are already made. Uh, and we took, uh, uh, we, we have reached out to every one of our uh, investee companies and our private investment uh, and, and equity uh, of, uh, investments and spoken to them at certain uh, at great length in certain circumstances uh, and uh, to uh, get their own assessment as to where they stand and what steps they have taken in order to be able to mitigate any challenges that they figure they think they will be facing uh, with respect to uh, the challenges in the environment. So, uh, and with, this is not uh, a one-time event. This is a uh, this is an ongoing process, uh, and we will be providing updates to the investment committee on Monday. Uh, we don't see uh, we are quite comfortable where we stand at this particular point in time. Uh, we're not uh, we're not overly concerned. There are always some gray areas and some edges, but at this particular point in time, we're feeling fairly comfortable. We, what we created was uh, that 
that you will see in your confidential attachment. We have created a, um, a, a risk weighting uh, and where we have determined what the risk categories are uh, for each of the, um, uh, those, the, our direct investments and our, our private equity investments. Uh, and we've ranked them from one through five. And then we've taken uh, the total dollar figures and compared uh, where we are with those figures against the total percentages. Uh, and this tool will be quite useful to us on a go forward basis, uh, for our, even in, in normal circumstances. It was something that we've been working on for some time. It continues to need refinement uh, and, we, and we will be uh, looking to our investment team and our investment committee for uh, their, 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 their advice as we move forward. Happy to answer any questions. Opening the floor for any questions uh, of staff. Councillor Kalobi, was that a raising of the hand? No? Okay. Councillor Carroll? And You're good. You're good? Okay. Would any member like to speak to this item? Yeah, uh, well, actually, I, would, I had a question for Tim. Uh, so, Tim, when you say that this is something you're kind of going through an ongoing uh, process on, is there, can you give us any any more detail than that in terms of how you think about it? And um, is like, have, you, have you documented that in any way? Or is it is it just a high level thing that you're just always talking to people about whether they need, about whether you they have other options in case we needed liquidity or something? Sure. So in this particular case, <clears throat> so we we are, uh, uh, yeah, have, let's say um, exaggerated the lines of communication uh, at this point in time. So we're constantly reaching out to each one of our clients on a much more regular basis than we would normally uh, to uh, hear their thoughts and to gather in information. Uh, so we've been um, and. What we are trying to do is develop um, a, uh, a quantitative analysis for each one of our clients that's different than we would normally look at with respect to uh, how their business operates in, in a normal course. Uh, and then we're using and use and, and we're trying to find some benchmarks and in, in yardsticks in that area that uh, we've not used previously. Uh, and so um, you're not hearing me. No, I'm hearing you, but it sounds like uh, maybe I got the topic confused. There was there's the general topic, I think, which you're in touch with each business to know how it's doing in each project. And then maybe I missed something, but I thought this had come up in the context of where uh, Julia was talking about getting liquidity if we needed any cash. No, this was different. This is a different topic. We moved on to pure stress test. This is a great topic. I'm glad you're doing it. And you're working on it. You're working on a quantitative method for that, which you would share. Yeah, <clears throat> we haven't we haven't moved that along very far. I will admit because of other circumstances uh, that we're dealing with at this time. But that's uh, you know we'll we'll by the time the the next uh, uh, June nineteenth uh, investment committee run, comes around, we're hoping to have had uh, at least a good start at that. Uh, and we are uh, again our, our the level of communication that we've got with all our clients has stepped up significantly at this particular point in time and we're reaching out to them and asking them you know has anything changed at all since the last time we reached out to you and we're getting we get very positive feedback from people and and for the most part we're really co comfortable where we are right okay well great and then my only thought on that randomly I mean just as it's here is that um, I would uh, you know, obviously you take advice from the investment committee on this, but my instinct is you don't necessarily need to be overly, like given our type of portfolio, it's not the type of portfolio that, that lends itself well to an overly quantitative or rigid or sort of extremely mm -hmm. defined model. You're really mm -hmm. looking for very broad yes. indications that something's in trouble. Half the risks are gonna yeah. be very qualitative, like the founders are checking out or something like that, you know, or the something like that's gonna be as big a deal as anything you're gonna be able to put a number on. No, no, I, I thank you for that advice. Company. I think that's 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 correct. Yes. Thank you. Would any other members like to uh, make any public comments on this uh, item? Nope. All 
right. uh, are there any members that would like to hold down this item for our in-camera uh, session? No. <laughs> I don't need to. Antoine's got his hand up. Oh, okay, sorry. Why don't I see Antoine? Antoine, would you like to speak to this item or are you uh, wanting to ask uh, some in-camera uh, questions on it? You know, I, it's probably good for public, but out of an abundance of caution, I, I, it's a brief question, and I think it should move to in camera. Okay. 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 We'll hold down this item for uh, in camera then. Thank you. All right. Parminder, it's Kim. I'm, I'm, I'm sneaking off, but Tim, I'll check with you after this regarding some of these items. Okay. Thank you, Kim. Kim uh, did send us a side note that she had to sign off at just shortly after 11. So thanks uh, for attending. Kim. Thank you. All right, then I'll move to our next uh, agenda item, which is TA 6.10, uh, Investment Committee Terms of Reference. Again, I'll turn it over to Julia for an overview on this item. All right. So, um, the, uh, this uh, is an item that um, we've been discussing with the investment committee for um, quite a little while, just thinking through um, an appropriate process um, for engagement of our expert committee members. Um, uh, the background to this is that we have a committee that is that has um, two types, well, several mandates, uh, policy, looking at the marketable securities, an increasing role in direct investments. And um, some members have more expertise on the, the policy and marketable security side. And some members have more expertise on the deal side. Um, and there was some discomfort um, in particular for with the, the from the former about um, basically making recommendations to the board on, on deals when they just didn't have that level of expertise. And, you know, not only just, you know, it maybe it was interesting to participate, but from a fiduciary perspective, just not having the, the real expertise to be able to, you know, solidly evaluate. And so there's the, the sort of overall, uh, one of the overall directions as we thought about the committee and then reflected in the terms of reference was to have, um, was the question was should we have two committees and that was a bit too complicated um and the in but also the the full investment committee wants to know about the whole thing we need to look at the full portfolio in its entirety and and have that make sense and and be prudent um but we needed to spend more time and effort on uh, direct investments especially um given that the subcommittee we created a little subcommittee on asset mix and a target portfolio and their advice was really to ramp up the direct investments um so what you see um coming through um you know broadly speaking in in these terms of reference is the creation of a subcommittee that is specifically focused on direct investments um and that would be drawn from the full investment committee but a continuation of a full investment committee process where um, we had, you know, the, the direct investment dynamic requires more frequent meetings. Um, and so we would have, um, we would continue to have four full investment committee meetings per year, um, plus with the full committee, plus another four just strictly uh, sub, uh, direct investment subcommittees. And so um, this is reflected in, in the ability to create a subcommittee um, in, in the terms of reference, but also um, a, a key element of this recommendation as we thought through kind of the process and the dynamic for, uh, for especially direct investments is, um, and you've been seeing this in practice at the board where we bring an investment that is recommended by the investment committee with and, and it and it's conditional um and so the the board is then saying to the, the that it approves the the uh, investments but it's 
asking the investment committee to make sure that those are fulfilled. And so this is really formalizing through, you know, just thinking through so that everybody um, is uh, aware. Oops, where's my, sorry, my computer. So that everybody is aware about who does what, you know, spelled out in the terms of reference um, that there is this opportunity for the, uh, the board to ask the investment committee to follow up on those conditional uh, those conditions that it made. Um, and uh, so, and then there were some housekeeping amendments in there. It hadn't been updated since uh, 2017 or so, and some things had come up. Um, the what I'm going to suggest, um, Mr. Chair, is that there is some. Um, uh, oh, sorry. One of the things that, if you recall, back I can't remember what, when it was, October 2019. We, the investment committee had recommended amendments to our statement of investment objectives and principles, the CEOP, um, and, uh, and requested council approval for that. That CEOP included um, uh, identification of a subcommittee that could make recommendations directly to the board. And so as a, as a governing uh, document, um, our council approved investment policy reflected that. We have some back and forth conversation going on with um, our colleagues at city legal and the clerk's office and our solicitor about um, about how to frame the motion in order to recognize that in fact um, the the require that 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 council approval um, is is relevant here. So you know if the board is delegating. Um, my perspective, but I'm not a lawyer and I will let the lawyers sort it out, um, is that when we take the, the CEOP contained um, a statement about this subcommittee and, um, and that that goes to council for approval. Um, uh, so in order to get all the legal parts right, I would suggest that we uh, hold this item um, so that uh, Lorraine and Cliff can have a chance to um, reframe the motion so that we get this right. Um, always defer to that those legal perspectives on these matters um, as it pertains to the relationship framework and council requirements. Um, so if you don't mind doing that with that background, um, we can bring it back. Uh, thanks for that, Julia. Um, and also uh, on this item, there is a little bit of redrafting on the actual recommendation uh, in the report. Carol, is it appropriate if, if uh, the redrafted, I don't know whether the, the lawyers have refu uh, reviewed this yet, but can we just send that out by email uh, to all board members so that they have it in their inbox uh, and uh, can take a quick look at it? Uh, Mr. Chair, the, the uh, conversation between legal that that Julia was referring to is about the motion. So it needs a bit of re revising and it's not yeah. quite ready yet. So once, when the item's held down, we can work on it. And uh, at the appropriate time, if someone's going to move it, we could put it, share it on the item and that way all board members can see it. Perfect, thank you. All right, with uh, the uh, request to hold that uh, item down, I will move to uh, the next item, which is TA 4 point, or sorry, 6.11. Um, I do want to do a little bit of a time check. So we're at 11.15. Uh, uh, we still have a, a few agenda items. Uh, we haven't taken a, a break uh, yet. Um, I'm uh, proposing that we keep uh, plowing through and unless uh, members are thinking we need to take a, a little bit of a break uh, and then we can reconvene. Can a show of hands, does anybody need a break or are we still can, uh, good to go? Okay, all right, let's uh, keep plowing through then. Uh, TA 6.11, uh, grant uh, recommendations. This is a report from the Chair of Grants and Programs Committee with recommendations. Uh, so I'll ask uh, Julia to provide an overview. And I will turn this over to Ryan. Nice. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, so we had uh, we had received eight grant applications at the last uh, intake round. Uh, the Grants and Programs Committee was unable to uh, convene as they normally would due to the same corn challenges that the board was facing. Um, but through uh, an informal conversation and virtual uh, uh, session that was held, uh, we were able to identify six uh, of the eight applications as meeting the uh, the typical uh, considerations that we would give to grant applications with respect to GHG uh, reduction potential, organizational capacity, uh, impact of the project, and so on. Um, however, we also identified an additional five criteria that we assessed each of the applications uh, under due to uh, the pandemic, pandemic and trying to assess uh, the impacts that it might have on the project outcomes and the ability of the grantees or the applicants to achieve those outcomes. And out of that additional criteria, uh, the chair with support of uh, committee and staff identified three projects, uh, applications that are being recommended uh, for funding at this time. Um, and Carol, if you could, we have a, a slide uh, just to refresh everyone's memory on which uh, three projects are being recommended for funding. Uh, those being uh, the Durham Region Transit, uh, scaling up to zero emission transit in the region of Durham, Hemina Institute's Project Coalition for Clean Fuels and a Clean Fuel Standard, and Pascal's Canada Zero Emissions Buildings Exchange Concept Development. Um, the remaining three projects that uh, were deemed to, to meet uh, the essential criteria uh, are being recommended uh, to be referred back to the Grants and Programs Committee for review in, uh, no, at their meeting in November. Uh, this will allow uh, staff to reconnect with these grantees to assess the impacts that COVID might have on their projects uh, and also uh, provide uh, more opportunity within the remaining grants budget to uh, cultivate grant opportunities uh, that have emerged in the last uh, couple of months. Thank you for that, Brian. Does any uh, members have any questions for staff? Good. Anyone like to speak on this item? Seeing none. Do we have a, a, or a motion that can be read out on this? I ask Antoine to move this motion. Mr. Chair, the, uh, the motion is displayed on the screen so everybody can see it. Okay. Let's give everyone a minute. Can you, uh, when you're ready, just uh, have a mo uh, move a motion to uh, accept the recommendations in this report? Uh, yes, if everyone is ready, I'm uh, moving a recommendation to move uh, report uh, TA6.11. Thank you. By show of hands, can I, uh, all members in favor? Thank you. Show of hands, any members opposed? Thank you, motion is carried. All right, so our next agenda item is TA 6.12, performance review of the Toronto Atmospheric Fund Chief Executive Officer. Um, I think this is a, a confidential matter. We will uh, hold for, um, uh, our in-camera session, unless anyone has any public uh, comments they'd like to make. 
Seeing none, we'll hold that one down. Item number TA613, appointment of officers. Yeah, can I turn this one over to you for an overview of the report? All right. Um, so if the current officers would be willing and able to remain as such, then the motion is as provided. Any questions of staff? I assume uh, those officers uh, have no objections. Anyone like to speak on this item? Okay. All right, with that, I'd like uh, by a show of hands, all those in favor of the motion to accept the appointment of these officers. Thank you. By a show of hands, any opposed? <clears throat> Thank you. Hopefully we haven't worked you too hard. <laughs> All right, I believe uh, now we are going to move into closed session. Carol might need some help here. So uh, members, we have items that require a closed session. I will move a motion for the board to go into closed session on items 6.8, 6.9, 6.10, and 6.12. I'd like to ask the board secretary to display and read the motion aloud. Mr. Chair, the motion is that the Board of Directors of the Toronto Atmospheric Fund recess its public meeting to meet in closed session to consider the following items. TA 6.8, cash flow analysis and options for liquidity, as it is about a plan to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Toronto Atmospheric Fund. Item TA 6.9, Direct Investment Risk Analysis Approach and Stress Test, as it, it is about a plan to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Toronto Atmospheric Fund and TA 6.12, Performance Review of the Toronto Atmospheric Fund Chief Executive Officer as it deals with personal matters about an identifiable person. Thank you, Carol. A show of hands, all those in favor? Thank you. By a show of hands, any members opposed? I think it's in the script. Thank you, motion just let me know when we can resume our closed session. Yes, we just need a moment, uh, Mr. Chair and members, to arrange the participants for closed session.
did um, a motion so that we can get that one off. Yeah, so uh, we've been going back and forth, and I think the original um, amendment to the motion, the word that council um, will be asked to approve the um, delegation of the ability to make direct investments. And I believe that's the form that was circulated. Um, is acceptable? Uh, it was circulated uh, with amendments just now. Um, it was circulated before we went on the break, and I just saw an email that recirculated. I, I think it's going to be recirculated it, but um, that the wording seems to be appropriate because what it does is separates out from the um, the terms of reference the um, delegation to the investment committee or the subcommittee, the investment committee, the ability to make um, direct investments if they fit certain parameters. And that is a concern that that is beyond what the SIOP provides the TAF authorized investment committee to do. Um, so there's a, there's a second, there's two delegations in there. One is a delegation um, that is to the investment committee, which is a standard delegation. There's this count, uh, the board has approved an investment and, and um, has authorized the investment committee to ensure that the terms and conditions of the investment and the documentation or whatever are in place. And then the investment committee can give the final approval, but the actual investment itself in you know, terms of the investment were already approved by the board. That's not controversial. Um, so that, that part of the delegation is not being referred to council approval. The second part of the delegation is that um, if TAF provides parameters to the investment committee of um, a dollar amount, a type of investment, and terms and conditions it must meet, that the investment committee itself or a subcommittee of the investment, investment committee would have the power to approve those directly. And that's the part that's being referred to council for approval. And the resolution clearly separates that from the rest of the terms of reference. Thank you for that. I've just asked that uh, we share the screens for the exact language on that uh, motion. Sure. And, and I think um, uh, Lorraine Strokes Kelly, uh, who's online, um, I, I'm, I think she's okay with that wording. Um, Lorraine, if you have a problem, you should mention. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm okay with the wording as uh, shown on the screen. It was the concern about the delegation of authority to directly award direct investments, and that is not currently provided for in the SIOP. It is the board, the TAF board itself, that must make recommendations of the investment committee to approve direct investments. So this is a shift delegate to the investment committee or the direct investment subcommittee to approve direct investments under certain parameters. Here, I just want to confirm, is this the entirety of the motion? Yes. Yes, it is, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, uh, quickly then, uh, is there anyone would like to uh, have any questions or uh, speak to this? Fortunately, with the sh uh, shared screen, I can't see if any, okay. <laughs> Tim, would you like to go ahead? Yeah. I just have a question because uh, both Cliff and Lorraine were cutting out. I couldn't hear uh, the, uh, so I'm looking for just the clarity. So this will, uh, we were looking for the subcommittee's capacity to be able to come to the board and make recommendations directly. Is that still within, uh, contained within the, these recommendations? Yes, and there's no change. Okay, thank you. All right, then I'd, if there's no questions or comments on this, uh, I'd like to formally move that we accept that recommendation. A show of hands, all those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? A show of hands? Pass. All right, for item number six, eight, and six, nine, uh, Carol, are there specific uh, um, 
motion that you'd like to put on the screen for those? Uh, for item 6-8, there's a recommendation in the staff report. We will put it on the screen. All right. I think we've all had a chance to uh, look through this uh, before, so I would like to uh, move that we accept this recommendation. All those in favor, by show of hands. Thank you. Any opposed? Period. Similarly, Carol, for item number 6-9. That's correct, Mr. Chair. We'll put the staff recommendation on the screen. Again, we've had a chance to look at this uh, recommendation, so I'd like to move that we adopt the recommendation as included in the report. So by show of hands, all in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? By show of hands. Thank you. Motion is carried. Last item, 612. Thank you for everyone for participating in that uh, discussion around uh, 612, Performance Review of Toronto Atmospheric Fund uh, Chief Executive Officer Review. Uh, again, Carol, can we put that um, recommendation on the screen? I'd like to move that we approve this recommendation. A show of hands, all those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed by show of hands? Thank you, carried. I believe that is the full business of this uh, meeting of the board. I thank you all very much for participating remotely. I would have loved to be doing it in person. I find that much more uh, uh, useful. And uh, but this was a, a pretty good, a pretty good one. I have one last uh, motion to put forward that uh, Councillor Layton be voted as the best COVID beard, beard I've seen thus far. <laughs> I had to take mine down uh, just the other day. <laughs> well, I may have to do that soon enough. But thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah. All right. With that, uh, I'd like to adjourn. I've you told him I'm soon going to lend him my Wilson basketball. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> That's right. A little Tom Hanks in that. Eh? <laughs> oh, good. All right. Hey, I want to wish everyone uh, to be healthy and safe. Uh, just your distancing, uh, wash your hands, and all that other good stuff. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Bye. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I joined too late for the last. Goodbye. <laughs> Carmen, that was excellent. Well done. Thank you. Thank you.